Hello, everyone. Welcome to part two of uh, chapter 26. Uh, so where we left off was we were discussing the glomerulus and the juxtaglomerular cells. And we said that the glomerulus is the site of filtration. So last lecture, I had drew this structure here out, what is called the... Um, filtration membrane where the pore, uh, where the uh, pores that are found in the fenestrated capillary of the glomerulus itself and then the podocytes that sit on it that create a uh, pedicels that then have slits between that act as a fine fesh, fine mesh filter that actually does prevent certain things from going in out now this is all driven by the capillary hydrostatic pressure the blood pressure in the capillary bed now this pressure in here is actually just a little bit higher because uh, and reason why is you come in the afferent arterial and leave the efferent arterial. Afferent arterial is a little bit bigger than the efferent arterial is, so there is generally quite a high pressure inside the glomerulus. And given that, this pressure forces the plasma across this membrane here between the pores of the endothelium and between the uh, slits and creates this filter through the filtration membrane and it filters it. And then that filtrate is the material made that your glomerulus will produce and then secrete into the Bowman's capsule. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's actually, I mean, you can see filtration pressure is positive because um, <clears throat> if there is a positive filtration pressure, uh, then you will do filtration. If it's negative, you'll do reabsorption. And if it's equal, you won't do either. If uh, you have a zero, uh, uh, filtration pressure is zero, uh, you have no net fluid movements. Now, filtrate will then pass into the Bowman's capsule. But notice, I've got plasma proteins. This is blood. If there was a red blood cell in here, it couldn't fit through the pores and slits. But solutes can. So things like sodium, potassium, chloride, uh, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, uh, ATP, other uh, dissolved substances, glucose, and other kinds of dissolved things, all kinds of dissolved solutes that can fit through this will go out into that filtrate. And I want to make a point here. Our book never really addresses this. But filtration is not a selective process. And what I mean by that is it just does it just happens. It is kind of whatever gets filtered gets filtered. There are things like right here, this solute here. It did not get filtered. Maybe this one didn't get filtered, but maybe it needed to be. But it just didn't get filtered this go. There will still be a chance to do that later. And that's kind of an important thing I want to bring out of this is the kind of randomness willy-nilly nature to filtration is not a selective process at all it happens and it's kind of really no control there now something that is extremely important for us to understand is that glomerular filtration without this you don't do anything else so without this you die uh, it would be fatal to ha not have this. There are diseases out there called nephritis, pyelonephritis and glomerular nephritis, uh, where you will learn about these diseases and patho, and uh, they can destroy this. You could die. Uh, kidney failure can result. And so without the filtration, so we say it's the first essential function, because if you don't do this, you can't do anything with the renal tubule. Now, Remember, like all capillaries, which the glomerulus is actually a capillary, it's just a capillary who begins and ends with an arteriole, so it has a very high 
blood pressure or capillary hydrostatic pressure, but there is also os osmotic pressure there. Now, the osmotic pressure, interestingly enough, at the glomerulus is equal to that of plasma. Plasma has a uh, osmotic pressure, blood colloidal osmotic pressure, about 300 milliosmoles per liter, and that's actually what the glomerular pressure is as well. So they actually are equivalent and that's what's very interesting about this. They are the same uh, osmotic gradient. Now, that's very important uh, in reality, but not for our course. So that is important for the overall functions. Now, what we're going to see is, guys, if you ever do increase the blood volume or increase the blood pressure, you increase the pressures in the glomerulus, thereby increasing filtration you're increasing the filtration pressure and that will uh, be able to adjust the amount what we call the uh, glomerular filtration rate now this is a very important laboratory value gfr is used as a critical kidney function metric on lab tests so the glomerular filtration rate, GFR, this is looking at how much filtrate is made per minute. Now, you make about 125 mils a minute and about 180 liters a day of filtrate. Now, I guarantee you, you don't pee out 180 mils or 180 liters of urine a day. I know you don't. I mean, you think about a two-liter soda bottle. Are you making, uh, you may, you know, at least a one liter bottle? Are you making 180 of those a day? No, you're not. You make that much filtrate, and that tells us something very interesting as well. We make far more filtrate than we make urine. So this is telling me that some of this filtrate does not become urine, and that's also rather important. Now, how do we regulate this GFR? Now, there's three ways to do this. Auto regulation, this is type of intrinsic regulation. Think back to AMP1, Chapter 1, intrinsic regulation versus extrinsic regulation within homeostasis. Something we would have talked about. I know I talk about. I don't know if anybody else does, but I do. Auto regulation is a type of intrinsic. What does that mean? It means it occurs within the system that you're regulating. So this, if you're controlling GFR, this is coming from the kidney itself. There is some hormonal regulation by the kidney. What I mean, renin. And then the autonomic nervous system as well will also go on in effect. Uh, using sympathetic nervous system primarily to adjust this. Of course, parasympathetic also can adjust this. And what we're going to see is if you increase blood pressure, you increase blood volume, you increase the glomerular filtration. Okay, if you increase the filtration, of course, you will increase GFR. Okay, so if blood flow ever reduce, uh, if you reduce the blood flow, you reduce GFR. Okay, now that makes a lot of sense. If you do not have as much blood going through the kidney or even through the whole body, if there's not enough to go through the body, of course, there's going to be less going through the kidney. And this is going to mean that you reduce the GFR. So what happens is, is think of this control of GFR is like somebody who does not know what they're doing to try to control traffic. Let's say we had a traffic jam and we wanted to get people off the interstate. So we get everybody to go off of the exit ramp, the first one they come to. Well, if everybody does it, eventually you're going to back up and you're going to have a backup. What they're doing is they dilate the afferent arterial. So you've got more blood will now be able to make a greater volume of blood can get into the glomerulus. Then we actually dilate the glomerulus. The glomerulus now has more blood in it. But then we do something stupid. We reduce how many people who can leave when they try to get them off the interstate. And now everybody's backed up and honking their horns and cussing each other and questioning everybody's mothers, um, uh, their, the purity of each other's mothers. Uh, you know, they're, they're really getting angry. And what's happened here is if we have more blood coming in by dilating afferent arteriole and we dilate the glomerulus itself, there is more blood coming in, more blood being held, but 
less blood is coming out, and this is like making a traffic jam that now has a lot of pressure behind it. And if I increase the pressures, I increase GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Now, hormonally, this comes in from RAS. Now, let's talk a little bit about RAS system uh, here real quick. Uh, RAS system is something we're going to need to discuss, and I, I do want to discuss the RAS and talk about how this happens and uh, uh, go through this. So if we talked about the RAS, the renin angiotensin system, um, RAS, what you've got is two major players. You have a liver and you have the kidney, uh, kidneys who are both going on. Now in the kidneys, remember we had a juxta glomerular apparatus. And especially we talk about the uh, juxta glomerular cells, okay? Those were the cells of the afferent arterial that we said produces renin. Now, here is the thing. Renin was made, but why? Well, we know that the stimulus is not enough sodium or too much potassium, or a drop in blood pressure. Remember that sodium and blood pressure go hand in glove here. Remember I drew that out in uh, the first lecture, showing that because sodium is a cation, it is hydrophilic. If it's hydrophilic, it attracts water, brings water towards it. That means it draws water into blood vessels. It increases blood volume. Now this renin here... Renin, our analogy for renin was like it was like a pair of scissors here. And the scissors, they cut something the liver makes. The liver makes a molecule called angiotensinogen. And when we see gen at the end of something, well, that is, should be a warning sign. That should say, warning, warning, danger, Will Robinson, that there is something that needs to happen here. This needs to be activated. And so I need a pair of scissors. Renin will then react with angiotensinogen from the liver, which will then make it, and it will make a molecule called angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1, remember there is an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. Now, there's actually different kinds. There's ACE1 and ACE2. You may have heard that ACE2, which actually is the opposite, it actually lowers blood pressure instead of raising it, it is the one, its receptor actually serves as the protein that allows COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, that causes COVID-19 disease to dock and enter. Okay, so now what we have with this ACE is ACE is like a pair of scissors here. Uh, and why is it like a pair of scissors? It takes our angiotensin 1 and makes it into angiotensin 2. And that was the role of ACE. ACE comes in and does that. Now, ACE, who reacts with this, angiotensin 2, it does some things. But we also know that angiotensin 2... goes to the adrenal cortex and it causes adrenal cortex to release the hormone aldosterone. Sometimes I cannot write aldosterone. Aldosterone here uh, does a variety of things. One of the things it will do is cause ADH to be released. Aldosterone will go on to help us to increase the sodium levels. It will help us decrease potassium. It will be a vasoconstrictor. Okay? And there's a variety of things that does. Uh, 
ADH is going to increase the fluid volume, which is increases the blood pressure. Sodium goes up. That's going to increase the blood pressure. Urinate out the potassium. Uh, vasoconstrict. But that's not all. We are going to see that it is a constrictor here that angiotensin 2, not only that, and now we're going to focus on angiotensin 2, that it is a constrictor of the efferent arterial. And that's actually more so our, fun, our thing here. So I'm kind of going to add this to what I've been talking about, constricts efferent arterial, okay? And that is going to help to increase GFR. I like to think of it like this. When I talk about GFR, sometimes I kind of imagine that this is kind of what's going on here that uh, we have this kind of roundabout and we have the capillary hydrostatic pressures here and when blood comes in the afferent and leaves the efferent and we're in here in the glomerulus that uh, normally we are forcing this fluid through this okay kind of imagine here that we're just pushing that through but if I dilate this and make it bigger, even bigger, and let more fluid in, and then I come into this guy and I constrict it, which reduces the fluid coming out, you, it is like putting a sumo wrestler on somebody and be like, uh, you know, it's like Yokozuna sitting on you. And so this is going to mean an incredibly increased GFR. So if you are doing this with RAS, does this and autoregulation, and here autoregulation is doing that, autoreg, then you've got a variety of means and methods in which to increase GFR. GFR is a very important thing to maintain. And uh, I do expect you guys to understand the overall outcome. This is a very important thing. This system that we're discussing and how RAS acts as a hormonal regulator of this is one of the one of the most uh, one of the most prescribed drugs is lisinopril in America, and it is an ACE inhibitor, and uh, so a very widely used class of drugs is ACE inhibitors, renin blockers angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 blockers, things like that. There's a variety of inhibitors and blockers and et cetera, et cetera, used to manipulate RAS. Uh, now, I do want to mention this. This is just something for your clinical nugget that you do not have to know this right now. But by the way, this chemical reaction, then when this happens, it happens in the lungs. And this is why an ACE inhibitor, an ACE inhibitor, one of the things is it causes a cough. This is why a persistent cough is one of the most common side effects of ACE inhibitor. Uh, is a constant dry cough. And it's because it begins to irritate the endothelium of the lungs in the respiratory membrane. And that's actually what's happening. All right. <clears throat> so I just like to tell you that. Okay, now auto, uh, the autonomic regulation, the sympathetic nervous system, it is a vasoconstrictor. It constricts the afferent, and that means less blood gets in. So this is going to act to reduce GFR and reduce urine formation. This is why sympathetic nervous system reduces your urine formation. 
Okay. Now, these are not things I will have you memorize. Uh, I uh, thought about it on the final, ex on the exam four, to kind of give you like a basic lab interpretation thing, and I just did not have the time to put it together yet uh, to the level I'd want it to be at. I'm not going to. Uh, that was before I got all your feedback back for exam one from the COPE during quarantine. And now I'm kind of at this point where, yeah, I, I did try to go a little bit easier on that second, on third exam, fourth exam, kind of hopefully following in that same vein. Uh, but let's take a look at this. You're going to see ions that are going to be higher in plasma than they are going to be in the urine, except for chloride. Chloride is one of these weird exceptions that is actually higher in the urine and that's telling you that that's how we're regulating that you bring in a lot of sodium and chloride see sodium is 135 145 these are mill equivalents per liter these are actually values you will need to memorize uh in the next chapter uh potassium is 35 3.5 to 5 uh mine actually for uh when uh, to tell you a very quick story when my potassium when i first started working here full-time i was first hired i was uh, fresh out of graduate school, and I, I was uh, given a full-time position and really was eager to show that I was burning the midnight oil, working really hard. I was single, unmarried, wasn't dating, or anything like that. And so I would come in every day at 7 a.m. I mean, I'd be here 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m. every single day, Monday through Friday, and a lot of nights I was working till 9 o'clock at night. And before that semester actually completed, I was sitting there one, one day working on stuff in my office, really trying to get ahead. Because actually, I mean, I was kind of barely keeping up at that time. I, I didn't have anything built. I, was, I just basically was thrown into the deep end and had to swim. And so really felt kind of overwhelmed. But I know one thing I was, I was you know, I was a bachelor for, you know, living on completely on my own uh all on my own nobody you know so and what had happened was one day i was in my office and dr lockhart comes into my office asked me a question or something and he said i thought it was weird because he was quiet <laughs> okay that's always his joke he likes to pick on me and i couldn't even respond i had no idea where i was i had no idea what was going on everything was a fog it's kind of like what you see in the movies and tv shows like those outer body weird experiences like i knew i was there but i didn't know i was there kind of deal and uh, what had happened after i finally got to the emergency room and i was giving fluids and everything uh as it stands my potassium levels were 1.9 i almost died that day uh, my heart almost stopped and i almost died um and the uh so yeah i mean these things can kill very quickly chloride about 100 to 108 uh bicarbonate 20 to 28 bicarbonate by two carbonate bicarbonate 20 to 28 bicarbonate it's kind of bicarbo 20 nate 28 bicarbonate 20 to 28 um and uh so what you'll see is now uh we'll learn the glucose levels but what i wanted to show you is here you could see i am actually keeping essential nutrients metabolites and nutrients are being kept but look at the waste products see you're maintaining you're using this this shows me that in plaza versus urine i am maintaining a normal electrolyte range by generally speaking urinating out far more than i need to or keeping it so you could see that with uh sodium it ranges so much because we take on so much sodium and chloride because we eat so much salt sodium chloride that's why it's always normal like that but you'll see the waste products in urine are far more higher than they would be in blood and that shows you some really interesting things now the three major metabolic wastes three major organic wastes the body's produced now i want to kind of preface this these things must be dissolved in water that's going to kind of help make sense next chapter that's actually where i kind of more so function with that a little bit and then a little later now urea 
is the most abundant one. You have the most daily in your blood is urea. You can see here urea is the most abundant thing. This is for breaking down amino acids, uh, things like that. Uh, it's called urea. Urea is for breaking down amino acids by the liver. Creatine is usually made by muscle contractions. It's a byproduct from your muscle moving. By taking creatine phosphate, which is a source for ATP in a muscle cell. If you, uh, something I teach when I do muscle contraction. And uric acid is done by taking your nucleic acids, especially purines. And it's from breaking down recycling nitrogenous what basis? Your, your uh, G's, T's, C's, and A's, but mostly anion guanine. And in guanine, A and G, all good uh, purines. Now, remember your renal tubule. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, renal tubule, we, we've mentioned the renal tubule. We've mentioned its function. We mentioned its basic processes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what I need to do here, I've got to go find, I think I have finally used up all my paper <laughs> from all my, uh, that I brought with me. Uh, give me one second. I gotta go grab some. A little pause, and then be right back. Okay, I'm back here. I was able to find some papers that I didn't draw on both sides of. All right. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about is reabsorption and secretion. Now, first off, what is reabsorption? Reabsorption is getting things back. Now, to really kind of help us understand it, let's talk about it this way first. Let's sketch it out. Let's sketch it so we can catch it here and see if we understand, help you guys understand it. It's a very big deal. So uh, what we're going to basically do here, let's talk about reabsorption. Reabsorption, and it feels so good. And secretion. Now, these are both what we call tubular processes. Now, what do I mean by tubular processes? I mean, guys, that I am discussing processes, cellular processes that happen at the renal tubule. Now, reabsorption. So let's say right here I've got a simple cuboidal cell and another one over here. Okay. Now, what you're going to have is we talk about that there was a capillary bed that was located nearby the tubule called the peritubular capillaries. So here we have peritubular capillaries. Okay, these are peritubular capillaries. Now over here, let's use orange since I don't have yellow. And this is going to be where filtrate, urine to be is. This is your urine to be called filtrate. Now reabsorption. Now, let's say I've filtrated something. I've produced filtrate, and it's going into the kidney, and it's making it through the nephron tubes that we drew before. And as it's making it, we go, oh, no, that's something valuable I could have gotten back. You notice that glucose was um, very high in the urine. I mean, not very high in the urine, but very high in the blood. That's what I was trying to say. And why is that is, well, how is it that it's not, like, it should be opposite, shouldn't it? I mean, shouldn't you have a lot of blood glucose? Well, there's a reason why you have so much more glucose in the blood than urine, because glucose does get filtered. And let's say right here that I've got glucose is in the filtrate. And this glucose would be something I would need. So the body has transport proteins to pull that glucose in. And, then, uh, and we could take that glucose here. And then we could pull it out back into here. And now that goes back to body. Okay. Now that is reabsorption. Reabsorption is getting something that was 
making it to the filtrate. Now remember, I just said at the beginning, I said it's kind of it's kind of useful to know that filtration is like a non-purposeful process. It's kind of random. It's higgledy piggledy. It's willy nilly. It just does. Reabsorption is getting it back because it was important. It's a necessary important molecule as glucose. If I can get it back to the bloodstream, that's reabsorption. Now, let's say, if I will, that I had some hydrogen ions that failed to get filtered. It did not get filtered. It made it through the glomerulus. It went into the efferent arterial and exited. Ended up in the venules, ended up in the peritubular capillaries. It did not get filtered, but we still need to get rid of it. Well, our body happens to have transport proteins to pull those in and put that into filtrate so that I can make it leaves in urine and we get rid of it. What are we doing? We are getting rid of what we failed to filter. Here, I'm getting back what I did not want to filter. Does that make sense? Reabsorption versus secretion. Those are two essential roles and very important to understand. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at, uh, so... The renal tubule reabsorbs or reclaims all the useful substances like amino acids, proteins, and glucose, things like that. Then the filtrate puts that back to the blood. It also gets back 90% of the water that's lost. Though we have to get rid of all those wastes that I showed you back here, all these wastes here, they have to be dissolved in water, but you don't need it all. You just need enough to get rid of it. And then we could secrete any waste product that failed to get into the renal uh, that failed to enter the renal corpuscle it just did not get it didn't get filtered filters filtration is a random process there is no rhyme nor reason it just happens things filter or they don't filter but luckily in the renal tubule i can get back what i what i actually mistakenly lost or i can lose what i failed to get rid of Secretion, reabsorption. Secretion is getting rid of what I failed to lose. Reabsorption is getting back what I did not want to lose. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> now let's take a look at this process of renal physiology. So what we're going to do, we are going to discuss the structure of the nephron one more time and remember our renal corpuscle you have our uh, afferent arterial our efferent arterial with the glomerulus in between which is about 50 intertwined capillaries and that this uh, glomerulus as we know it is surrounded by a Bowman's capsule and then the Bowman's capsule gets a little wavy gravy. Then we have our uh, loop of Henley. And our collecting system. Okay. So, real quick, Bowman's capsule, loop, proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, <clears throat> and the glomerulus. I'm just going to put glow. Okay, just keep this simple. Now, what we want to understand here, first off, we know that when blood plasma makes it into the afferent arterial and enters the glomerulus, that pressures force the fluids across this in such a way that it passes through the filtration slits uh, and fenestrations, 
and it produces a fluid here called filtrate. What is filtrate? Filtrate is urine to be. It is not urine yet, but it can become urine. Okay, now, what I want to do here is discuss that our proximal convoluted tubule, uh, before I do that, actually, now I need to add something. <clears throat> now, remember, we had a thing that's called radar love. No. We had a thing that's called peritubular capillaries. I made it a little too skinny there, but it's okay. Peri tubular capillaries. So here's a peritubular capillary. This is the ferron arterial, a ferron arterial, glomerulus. I'm going to say glom. Peritubular capillaries wrapping around the renal tubule. Okay, now, what I want to talk about here. First thing, proximal convoluted tubule. What does it reabsorb? It reabsorbs 60 to 70% of water from the filtrate. Okay, so what is that reabsorption? We pull 60 to 70% of the water that was in filtrate and pull it out and bring it to the peritubular capillaries. We reabsorb it. We reabsorb 60 to 70% of water from here. Ions and nutrients. Okay. Ions and nutrients. So we want to add those two. Okay. Ions and nutrients. All go back. So this water, these ions, and these nutrients are now going to go back to the body. Okay, they've been reabsorbed. The proximal convoluted tubule reabsorbs 60 to 70% of water, ions, and nutrients. <clears throat> and there is also some secretion that happens uh, that I, want, I will talk about more in detail here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what it secretes later on. And I'm going to write secretion. Okay. So we see the proximal convoluted tubule are involved in those processes. Now the loop of Henle, it reabsorbs two-thirds of what water is left. Okay, so of the 60-70% of water, it's going to get two-thirds of that back. Okay, now this is what's really interesting. Let me kind of help you guys understand something here. Here we have that filtrate moving that way. It will go through here and it will move up that way. This makes, of course, this the ascending limb and this the descending limb. There is actually a thick segment and a thin segment. Now, what's interesting about the thick segments are is the thick segments are permeable to solutes but not water. Why? They have proteins in them that allow solutes to come out. The thin segments are permeable to water but not solutes. Why? Because they're so thin. Okay. And there's going to be ways for that to leave. Okay. Now, let me help you guys understand something. Right now, what is left? Let's imagine that I had some chicken noodle soup here. And I put the chicken noodle soup in a pot to heat it up. And I forgot about it. And when I come back, it's almost a syrup. Okay. And that's kind of what you're doing. You're kind of cooking the water out, you know. So if I've got 60-70% uh, of the water, I'm going to get two-thirds of it more of it out but how's that going to happen well in the um i'm sorry i wrote ascending and descending here i just now caught that uh d l a l 
I am so sorry, guys. You can kick me in the teeth when you see me next time. <laughs> That's my fault. Pretty tired. It's been a long two days. Okay, so what's going to happen is in the ascending limb, there will be a protein. And this protein is able to transport one sodium, one chloride, and one beer. No, uh, it's not one bourbon, one scotch, one beer. No, it's one sodium and one chloride. Now, what's happening is it makes the fluid around the tubule salty. Now, remember osmosis, osmosis. It's a real hoot. Water always moves towards the greater solute. Okay. Now, guess what? I pulled some of the sodium and chloride out here, which actually diluted this. And then here I pulled water, which actually concentrates it. I oftentimes call this the concentrating segment and this the diluting segment. So I've diluted it now and concentrated it now. And this is going to get, it's like, man, too salty, too salty. So it's like one sodium, one chloride, pump that out. Osmosis, osmosis, it's a real hoot. Water always moves towards a greater solute. Why? We made it even more salty. We pulled the water out, now it's even too salty again. So what does the body do? It's going to keep doing this. It's going to be like, okay, one sodium, one chloride, osmosis, osmosis, it's a real hoot. Water always moves to the greater solute because we made it even more salty. And we keep pulling this water out. Now, you may be wondering, what's going to happen to all this water here? All this water gets reabsorbed by the loop of Henley. What's going to happen to all this salt? What's going to happen to all the NaCl here that I've produced? It's going to get reabsorbed. So the loop of Henle is involved, guys, with the reabsorption of the remaining sodium and chloride and also some water, which we're, a lot of water we're going to talk about. Now, the thin segments reabsorbs the water because it's permeable water but not solutes, and the thick reabsorbs the sodium and chlorides because uh, it's not uh, it's soluble, it's permeable to water, but not uh, to not um, uh, it's not permeable to water. It's only permeable to the ions. Now the distal convoluted tubule. This is what's about 15 to 20 percent. So by the time it gets here, the filtrate is about 15 to 20 percent of what it was. So what's here? I'm only 20 to 15 percent of that. What's left of me is only 15, 20% of what I started with right here, okay? I started as a fluid I, uh, identical to solute composition to plasma to now only 15, 20% of what's, what came, what was here is left after all this alteration. Now, <clears throat> when this happens... There's still stuff that can be done. We are going to secrete ions, acids and, uh, acids and drugs and toxins. So let's take ions, acids, drugs, toxins, bad things, and let's secrete them. Let's, now, it's variable according to what hormones. Like, uh, now, it's no longer like blood, but it depends on the hormones. And now, I'm going to write on here variable. I'm going to write variable. This is variable especially for ions, acids, uh, these two here. Especially variable for those. Drugs and toxins pretty much always go, but there is some variableness there. It could really depend upon the pH of the blood. This is why a lot of times drugs, if you want them to last for a long time, you have to put a, a certain pH with it, or you have to put it with a protein, or make it lipid soluble. There's different things you could do to make it lipid soluble. It'll last longer. It won't get excreted as quickly or broken down as quickly. 
uh, something you'll, uh, we talked about in endocrine system. Just replace hormone with drug, guys, and you've got it, and that's going to help farm make more sense. Okay, that's a lot of physiology going on in the kidney. Now, just real quick, if you think about this, if I somehow stopped pumping all this sodium and chloride out, then I would not be able to reabsorb all that water. And I wouldn't be able to reabsorb all this sodium and chloride either. Which means it wouldn't get back into the bloodstream. Guess what? There's a class of drugs called loop diuretics that prevent this from happening. So instead of all this water going back to the blood and all this sodium and chloride going back to the blood, it stays in the solute and you pee them out. And that's what loop diuretics do. Uh, most of these usually affect the sodium, potassium, ATPase pumps of the kidney. Uh, there's a variety of loop diuretics out there, uh, but diure diuretics uh, influence urine formation. Diuresis is the proper name for this. It's actually called diuresis, urine formation. And if you, uh, a diuretic is anything that affects it. Now, there's some potassium sparing diuretics out there called spirolactone. Spirolactone uh, also shuts down some of the sodium potassium ATPase things, but it's actually an aldosterone regulated sodium potassium pump uh, that I do believe because spirolactone blocks aldosterone's actions in the kidney. Um, <clears throat> okay, now, beyond that, Sodium and calcium are the big ones for hormones. That's, that's some big ones. Now, our collecting system, we know, begins inside your cortex, goes to your medulla. There's the collecting duct. Now, the collecting duct and the papillary duct. The collecting duct, you can do reabsorption of water, reabsorption of secretion of all these other things. Now, what I'm going to do, <clears throat> sodium, potassium, hydrogen, bicarbonate. Sodium, potassium, hydrogen, bicarb. These things here can go both ways, okay, in the collecting duct. Now, that's important. Uh, this is uh, important for the next chapter in a big way. Uh, depends on what hormones and other things are going on. Now, the papillary duct just said, now we have urine. So we've made urine. We go into the minor calyces. And trying to make it look like a droplet here. <laughs> Good to the last drop. Now we've got urine and uh, whatever that urine's composition is because all this modified it. Guys, if you can draw that out, you understand urinary physiology better than most people ever will. Okay? Most people never really grasp it. And I'm going to tell you a few times, and I'm not trying to brag, but I am trying to say it is my job to prepare you for what comes. And there's been a handful of times where nursing faculty, especially for our program, they were coming to my class to recruit my students. And they were standing outside my classroom. And one of the times they heard me doing this. And the nursing faculty came in and told my students, I wish someone would have taught me this. I could not understand any of the diuretics. But they said, if you have this, my gosh. And I'm not kidding you guys. I'm not doing it. I know that there's some who don't cover this stuff. But if you don't understand it, you're in trouble when you go to your programs. This is the difference between you can get in your programs with an A. That A doesn't mean you have A knowledge. And it's my job to build you up, okay, to help you guys understand the material. And I will bust a gut to do that every day for you, okay? Now, ultimately, guys, that's the nephron. That's the jobs going on. Now, there's actually two types of nephrons out there. There's cortical nephrons, which are 85% of the nephrons. These are the smaller ones. They have very short loops of Henle. They're up in the cortex, most of it. There's a little bit that might go down into the medulla, but majority of this is up in the cortex. Then you've got, and these guys, they perform most reabsorption and secretion. But juxtamedullary nephrons, who are 50% of them, they have this really elongated loop of Henle. 
And because they have an elongated loop of Henle, and they go down into the medulla, they have something very interesting. And I want to talk about this. They can concentrate urine dramatically, and they have vasorecta. Vasorecta is something I guarantee, there's only two of us that I know who talk about vasorecta. Let me help you understand vasorecta. Now, the way I like to think about vasorecta is it's a bridge over troubled waters. If you guys are familiar with Simon and Garfunkel, like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. And what it does is it goes from one of these loops to the other, and this is vasa recta. Now, if you had a very elongated loop of Henley, the vasa recta can take all this water here, And go there and not dilute this part of it, leaving it available to do other things. Because if I diluted it, I would reduce its osmotic pressure to reabsorb ions. But this allows you to reabsorb a tremendous volume of water without diluting down here to get back all these ions, okay? And I hope that makes sense, vasa recta. Found only on juxtamedullary nephron. So basically what happens is this. Your filtrate gets to the glomerulus, and there is the same osmotic concentration of plasma, except no protein, no cells. Now that's important, and I may ask you that. That might make a really good written question is, is... Uh, uh, does filtrate contains protein cells? Yes, uh, yes or no, explain. Then that uh, the for filtrate goes in the renal tubule, proximal convoluted tubule, your ions, your organics, and water and things like that. 67% of the filtrate, uh, tubular fluid, everything in there, you got 60-70% of that stuff gets back, reabsorbed back. PCT, uh, your proximal convoluted tubule, uh, and, and then the descending limb together kind of do the tubular fluid. So only about 15 to 20 percent are actually going to make it out. Is your thick ascending limb uh, is impermeable to water but not sodium and chloride. So it pumps the sodium and chloride out where the thin segment is permeable to water. Um, so it's actually acting your thick ascending limb is actually only about 100 milliosmoles per liter. And that's because, guys, it should be far more concentrated. But it's the diluting segment. And I need to put the concentrating segments milliosmoles. Uh, I think I've got it here. Um, <clears throat> it, gets down, it gets about as concentrated as 1,200. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and put that in there. Uh, not, I never test on it. Uh, and um, it's just something that I um, <clears throat> that I like to kind of have in there for kicks. It's not something you're ever going to get tested on. Your solutes then get adjusted through variable reabsorption, secretion, active transport hormones, variable reabsorption. Distal convoluted tubule water cannot be affected, but ADH can be secreted to affect water in the distal convoluted tubule, especially important for where the vasa recta and peritubular capillaries reabsorb that. But the only way water can move in the distal convoluted tubule is under the control of ADH. Something I wanted to mention there that I haven't mentioned yet is ADH is the only thing that controls the movement of water here. Vasa recta uh, and peritubular capillaries, they absorb the water and solutes from the tubular fluid. Now, the vasa recta, they're the ones that let me get all that water back without diluting the rest of the peritubular capillary. And here you can actually see reabsorption and secretion. What I was drawing was uh, secretion is getting rid of what I like, here's the hydrogen ions. We're secreting it. 
reabsorption, blue arrows getting it all back. Okay. Uh, and here is the summary of all the main functions. Um, now, I will not even cover this now. I'm not even going to talk about it as it's not on the test, never has been on the test. I keep it in case anybody ever needed to know it for things like um, uh, farm, but I'm actually not going to cover it. Now, reabsorption, remember, you uh, reabsorb in the proximal convoluted tubule. We use some of the proteins to reabsorb things like amino acids, glucose, vitamins, any essential materials. Uh, if it's things like lipids, it can actually passively move because they're lipid soluble. If they are non lipid soluble substances, then they have to go through a protein. Um, and sorry that I'm doing this. It's just, it was bugging me that I didn't have it done. And uh, I keep, I never notice it until I'm teaching. So now's the time, right? Secretion of things like ammonia. I said I would tell you what it secretes later. It secretes things like ammonia. And there are some other drugs that we remove from the uh, blood as well, especially the water-soluble drugs. Um, loop of Henle. Now, it reabsorbs sodium and potassium by an active transporter. One sodium, one potassium. And it pulls water out by my meiosis. And this is what I was talking about. This is called countercurrent multiplication in the loop of Henle. You take your thick ascending limb and you have a protein that is a sodium chloride co-transport. Remember, co-transport is the transport of two substances across the same cell membrane in the same direction. Chapter 3. That this is pumped, one sodium, one chloride pumps out, making the fluid around the tubule very salty, which draws water out. And then the concentrated fluid that's coming to the ascending limb makes it pump more sodium and chloride out, which pulls more water out of the descending limb, which then makes the ascending limb have to pump more sodium and chloride out, which makes the descending limb remove more water in a positive feedback loop. Doing this, creating a concentration gradient, and here's what's important. Yes, it reabsorbs water and solutes. Yes, it creates a concentration gradient. Yes, but why? So I can absorb water passively. Do you know that if you couldn't do this, pretty much peeing would kill you? It'd be fatal to urinate? Just saying, guys. It'd be fatal to urinate. <clears throat> my version, I'm going to tell you guys what my, um, this is, what, I, I don't know if they already come up with that on their own, but I, if not, this needs to go to Jeff Foxworthy, uh, is honey. Uh, so redneck word of the day, urinate. Honey, I thought my last girlfriend was, uh, my honey, my last girlfriend was a six, but honey, you're an eight. <laughs> okay. Um, now, distal convoluted tubule, uh, using some of your sodium and chloride as well. Reabsorption, depending on the hormone aldosterone, will determine which way aldosterone regulates reabsorption and secretion. Secretion of potassium, reabsorption of sodium, and a controlled aldosterone. PTH and CT regulating reabsorption of calcium. ADH regulating reabsorption of water in the distal convoluted tubule. Uh, now, what is urinalysis? Urinalysis is a studying a normal urine, which should be clear and sterile. Urine should not be cloudy. If it's cloudy, there's an infection. Urinary UTI or something somewhere. That UTI can make it up the urinary tract, ultimately end up becoming uh, pyelonephritis from uh, something like E. coli from the urinary tract. Now, also, it should be four times more concentrated than plasma, and it's yellow because of the urobilin. Urobilin is bilirubin that makes it here, and it eventually gets converted to what's called urobilin. And a urinalysis is just our study of a urine sample. We analyze it. There might be very many reasons we want to do that. Uh, studying a diabetic, studying it for infection, studying it for other things, studying it for hormones, studying it for electrolytes. Let's say a patient might have diabetes insipidus. We might want to do a urinalysis, make sure there is too much sodium in the, in the urine, things like that. Um, kidney failure, what have you, may involve urinalysis to some degree. Various reasons you would do that. Do not really learn these characteristics. Um, <clears throat> now, you make about 700 to 2,000 meals a day. Now, I said you make well over 1,000 liters of filtrate a day and only make 700 to 2,000 milliliters a day. 
Okay. But it is far more. Blood's osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles per liter. This is so much more concentrated. Uh, it now, depending on what's in there, odor. I mean, like if you ate apple, let's say you ate some um, some uh, uh, corn smack cereal, it might make your urine smell funny. Or you ate some, um, you drank a lot of coffee. Some of the chemicals in coffee might end up into that, making the urine smell a little coffee odor. Uh, you may end up with something else. Uh, it should be sterile. Should be no bacterial content for a normal urine. If it's not normal, then it okay. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the ureters. Ureters are what moves the uh, urine from the kidneys to the bladder. They are muscular tubes. They have three layers. They have a mucosal layer inside of transitional epithelium. Saw that back in uh, histology section day one of AMP1 lab. Middle muscular layer of smooth muscle that's longitudinal and circular, two layers so they can spasm. And then there is um, uh, a renal capsule and some of that, the outer connective tissue layer of the ureters. Uh, they, it actually fuses to peritoneum, which is also important since it fuses to peritoneum, uh, but kidneys do not. Kidneys are retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneum. It's all, what can happen to a patient is, is that if they lose all their perirenal fat, renal fat, this will droop and their kidney will fall down, but this hose will stay there and it kinks it and you die of uremic poisoning. It's called a floating kidney, but really the kidneys are, kidneys are not floating. It's a renal ptosis, a drooping, sinking kidney. The bladder is uh has openings here for the ure ureters and then the trigone is formed by the two ureters and the bottom opening for the urethra forming a triangle that takes you to the internal urethral orifice inside the bladder is rugae that allows it to stretch and the detrusor muscle is the muscle that depolarizes to squeeze it, it squeezes the bladder empty the urethra that urine passes through has a lamina propria it has a mucous membrane with folds in it, longitudinal folds, and then scattered in here are mucus secreting cells in these pockets so that whatever, because urine is usually going to have acids and things in it that could damage, so it is uh, always covered in a mucus layer. Last thing we're talking about is micturation. How do you pee? Urination or micturation has a micturation reflex. Now, what sets this off is urine fills the bladder and the bladder wall just stretches. We call that distension. The stimulus of bladder distension goes to your CNS. Your CNS goes, yes, my bladder is distending. Then what happens, we need to have a relaxation of both sphincters. Now, there is a coordinated effort. What has to happen is your external ureteral sphincter must relax first before the internal but actually 500 mils or more can force open the urethral sphincter and you pee on yourself so how does this happen stimulus distension of the bladder information comes up to the brain the brain goes yep brain this has happened we now can make a voluntary relaxation of the external sphincter which will automatically cause an involuntary opening of the internal sphincter. And there's different nerves involved in that. I kind of wish our book did a little bit different, but it is into both. But the external sphincter, uh, it, uh, the external one is the one you volunteer. When you go to pee and you're going, uh, as soon as you do that, it causes you to release the urine. And it's parasympathetic fibers that uh, cause the detrusor to contract. So it's automatic. You feel like you've got to pee and you feel like, man, my, um, my bladder is constantly spasming. And a lot of times with infections, it will release histamines uh, with an infection. And the histamines will go to the smooth muscle and cause them to spasm. And this is why you feel like you have to pee all the time when you guys have a bladder infection is because the bladder's muscle, detrusor muscles are spasming due to the histamine release. Histamines will actually stimulate the smooth muscle. All right, guys, that's it for urinary. Uh, thank you so much. Two more to go. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I'll actually going to finish one of them here, uh, fluid and electrolyte. Uh, reproduction is going to be the hardest one to get through, but we will get, I will get through it. 
Um, but guys, thank you so much for everything you've done this semester so far. Thank you so much for your hard work. Keep at it, guys. Stay safe, but just keep at it. You can do this.